<sighs> Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Mr. Dogbot333, and welcome back to Hard Time for Newer Last Days Europe as Stay Guan Dong. Now, in the last video, everything started imploding around us. The oil crisis is not going well for us. Um, but we're trying our best. Our misadventures in the Middle East gave us good data, but it didn't do too much to change the, uh, the, uh, outcome of a lot of these conflicts. We still have some support from Zujin and Chinese, so I might want to utilize that. Have more Zujin support, so I'll use that. A bit more. But she have dreaded the Q&A sessions of any major press conferences, as did any competent corporate executive. Even if at an advance, the questions posed by the gallery would inevitably contain curveballs, misleading inquiries, and subtle insinuations that weighs Matshida's Mat ire. Day out, Japanese executives invited to the government briefing on the extension of Guangdong's existing social measures spoke plainly. Too plainly. I understand the why. Truly, we are grateful to the government will to play poise when we, what we are unwilling to, given the present circumstances. The head of a shipping company made a show of signaling's approval before coming with the most salient question of all. But how is this set going to be funded? The government prepared airing a set of well-distributed measures that will not affect the headline tax burden. Headline is easy. What matters are the details, a subject that claimed the career of Chief Executive Suzuki Taichi all those years ago. Really, wondered Matsushita, bringing out the example of Suzuki's failure, failed and retired policies as a counterexample. Threatened the question was overt and explicit, and Matsushita felt now qualms, retaliating in turn. Suzuki's failure was making too many enemies. I don't see any enemies here today, nor do I wish to create more, a sentiment I hope that you all share. The room fell silent, and the questioning executive quickly sat down under the withering disdain of the crowd. Matsushita will never pay. I'll shoot. So we're going to try to freeze the budget. The economic crisis brought about by the conflagration in the Middle East swirls ever greater instability and violence. Economic confidence remains at best lackluster, with corporations and entrepreneurs simply unwilling to consider any ma major measures. Chief Executive Matsushita's Air Force left with no choice but to retort to increasingly desperate measures, such as decreeing a budget freeze. Freezing the budget thereby, and thereby drastically limiting future spending may well provide the economic certainty that Guangdong needs to get back to normal. We must be cautious, however. This would certainly be a terrible handicap to us if major future expense becomes unavoidable. So we should keep an open mind to this concept of not per pursuing this me measure. This is a, uh, this is rough. But we're doing okay seat-wise. A little bit of corruption. Out of the police. Attack white collar crime. <coughs> Excuse me. that'll get us our interest. Now we just need the quality. 1250, 750. 1250. Shit, 750. I'll do it. That's fine. Gets us maxed out. Let's try weathering the storm from here. Thanks to our adept response in the areas of finance, corporate, 
cooperation with other Big Five executives, and the issue of production, we've successfully brought an end to the worst of your oil crisis' terrible effects. Progress is made, and the recovery has begun in earnest. But the chaos is not over yet. There is a terrible, terrible instability and collapse still ongoing within Guangdong's borders and outside of them. The next few months will be absolutely critical. We must be extremely cautious in the way we go about things. If not, there's a risk that the hard work of our chief, esteemed chief executive will all be thrown out of a window like briefcases. Or during the hellish time that was the Suda crisis. Oh god, we have a choice. If you want to convince investors that Guangdong is good for its money, then freeze the budget. The wall mounted it clock ticked onwards, the entire room fell silent, it coised wards. While well, the man looked entirely nonplussed, taking a leisurely drag on a cigar. Chief Executive Matsushita Masaharu and Chief Exec Secretary Ibuku Masaru exchanged several hesitant glasses, glances. Even as Se External Secretary Morita Akio and Commissioner Shushita Kunisori tore into your Koi's proposals, he suggested we tell everyone else to fend for themselves. Why don't you come to the police headquarters and tell my officers their pay is frozen? If investors run, there's, there'll be no money for anyone. The Koi exalted a great plume of cigar smoke into Morita and Shushita's face, offering no compromises. Reviewing unnecessary spending, with Leko's approval, is exactly what we should be doing in a downturn. Ibuka tapped his pen incessantly against the arm of his chair, called an order as Morita, Chushita, and Yokoi squared off against each other. Take a point, Yokoi, but while we're always supporting minimizing waste, that's entirely different from painting ourselves into a corner with promises we might not be able to keep. Things get worse from where they are now. What are we to do? What do we say if the Japanese start asking for assistance? Yokoi pursed his lips, digesting Ibuka's rebuttal without openly acknowledging it. He and everyone else in the room turned towards Matsushita. God, we had a lot of choices here. Tell the Lyco we're freezing the budget. Freeze a budget in order to resuscitate confidence in the government's ability to control the budget. It's going to, uh... It's gonna hurt us a lot. God, it's gonna hurt. But we're already feeling pain already. That as much as we can. go back on the main stage. Like, that's all we can do. As we look up from containing the effects of the old crisis from our own territories, we are astounded and worried at what we see around us. The chaos was by no means limited in the st state of Guangdong. There is turmoil across the co-prosperity sphere and the entire world more generally. There are many things that give us cause for anxiety, just as many opportunities that pique our curiosity. We have no small amount of problems to deal with. First, we need to address the fact that Chinese laborers, angry at the situation, are leaving Guangdong en masse. Second, we need to take action about the rumors of Japanese companies withdrawing from Guangdong. Finally, more familiar, we need to square off with the ever-present squabbles of Blood Co. Our work's cut out for us. Tanaka Kazui sat down in his office blocks lunchroom and watched the science of business on the mend. Looking through the recently repaired glass windows, he saw his friend Yamamura Shinji Miyamoto. And a whole box, lot of new hires they hadn't seen before moving boxes around. I'm good. Minecraft Master for 2069. Beautiful username. I've been okay. How are you? Changing his focus to the clear set eyes of Koshu outside the now peaceful streets below, he knows signs of recovery and the return of hope there too. Hawkers were once again confident enough to sell their delicate wares. Good, civilized people, not rioting Bolshevik degenerates, now throng the streets of his city once more. There are fewer and fewer closed permanently signs visible in the office, other office blocks, as you could see. 
the businessman turned back to his lunch and began to chew, reflecting on the ways things had gone. Times had gotten tougher for him and his family during the crisis. At times, stricken by despair, Kazuhi had had nothing more to do than hold on to his family and weep with them for all here they were worth. The stress, too, took a great toll, he noted. So he felt a sharp pain in his chest that had not been there last decade. But overall, Kazuhi was satisfied. Things could have been worse, but he and most everyone else he knew had made it through one way or the other. At least he could rest easier now. going to give us what we need to get the ashen lit face aide entered his office to announce the arrival of chief of police but she allowed himself a brief moment of grimace and run his hands through his hair judging by looking poor man's face the chief was not happy this impression was quickly vindicated the street chief strode into the room boots clacking and sp Fiddle flying. This is absurd! Our lines are stretched thin as it is. The Chinese are probing our borders, and within our cities, groups are distant or waiting for the right moment to strike. Now that our force has been castrated through these budget cuts, our door is open to full-scale insurgency. Calm yourself. This behavior is unbecoming. Reports to me have shown the situation with internal dissonance is concerning but manageable. Ken Pai Tai corroborate this. The chief took a few deep breaths. The tremendous red sheen over his face faded to a dull blush. For the moment, yes. But the situation is delicate. This may be exactly the trigger the Chinese need to rise against us. I understand the need for financial security, Chief Executive, but my area is state security. I'm telling you that this is a dangerous game you're playing. Shit. Um, grant police exemptions. We have to stay secure at all costs. But we'll get some bonuses towards admin funding, at least. And that's just about it. Akiya noticed that Matsushita's office was unclean, filled with a stale ale and subtle heat that seemed to eat away at its occupants. It was time for its weekly briefing, briefing as external secretary, and for perhaps the first time he was ready to run through the basics and get out. Alas, this was a report he had to give. Squandong's foreign relationship appeared to be drawn near their breaking point. Marita dropped a dozen or so newspapers on Matsushita's desk. It's in every paper. Kosher Weekly. Mass investor exodus over Chinese market crash. Guangzhou over Bao. China announces Japanese oil crisis plans. Even Canton Fujin Corona has reported about the situation. Chinese migrants return to homeland. It's a complete collapse of Chinese-Japanese relationship at the worst possible moment. As a primary point of contact between the two, it's already affecting us. I've seen reports that lines along the Guangdong border are three hours in and six hours out. If we don't do something... Matsushita reached a hand out towards the newspaper, letting them crash under the carpet. He turned up to look at the minister, revealing deep bags under his eyes. Stop, Marita. I received call after call. The world is already asking me about these problems. The press are ringing off the hook. The Chinese and Japanese consulates have each called me in for a meeting. I'm aware of the situation. Now please, give me a few hours to myself. These days, you'd be the only one. Let's try our own initiative. We could certainly call upon our potential allies in the Guangdong Legislative Council or lean to some of our underhanded allies among the 100% legitimate businessmen of the Guangdong underworld to solve our current problems. We have no need to pursue either option in the light of our strength and our, our chief executive and his well-known ability and acumen. Our chief executive is a prudent, cautious man. He trusts his own abilities and views others, those of others with well-merited skepticism and suspicion. In these turbulent times, he thinks 
It is elevated and correct to concentrate power where he can effectively control and distribute it, rather than r running the risk of ambitious potential rivals causing many trouble. We agree with him. We need to get a 48 billion. We could get to that. I doubt we will. We could. The halls of the Korshu government complex were a dreary warring of unremarkable linoleum corridors on the best of days. You know, Shiko could feel instantly that today was even worse. Zijin clerks and Japanese middle managers shuffled past with murmured acknowledgments. Their gazes weighed down on the floor, while the break room was silent and deserted of their usual tittering clientele. So the rumors were true, Yoshiko said, even as she trailed a respectful two steps behind her guide, staff of the Education Bureau. I've never seen a government complex this depressed. Yes, Miss Yasukawa. Wholesale cuts to the personnel budgets, effective immediately. The worker sighed wearily. No bonuses or raises, and they're not replacing anyone who leaves. Wait, not even hiring replacements? So all the piles of garbage on the street are the haggard faces of teachers and maintenance crews? Even as people leave, the work stays. A guy didn't even bother lowering her voice as she passed by an older ma manager, paying no attention to the dirty look he received. No matter what you hear from the management today, that's at the root of the problem. What has he been seeing for the past month? Not smarter. Hopefully this isn't a mistake. I already bypassed a focus, interestingly. I'm guessing that's because we passed the thing, actually. Sitting back in his office, in his usual chair at the end of the day, Matsushita grimaced as he thought of his options for strengthening control over Guangdong. He reached out to the Legend of Council and his fellow tycoons within it, such as Morita and Komai. Then again, he could also reach out to Yakuza through Yokoi, which would be useful for all that would cost him morally. Or... No. No, Matsushita couldn't bear to suffer this indignity any longer. Why should he have to choose between which man would should inevitably become his puppet master. He refused. He would stand on his own for once in his life, and endure what life has to throw at him, without the help of anyone, save for his subordinates. Only he, Matsushita Masahara, knows what's best for Matsushita Electric, for Guangdong, for every last person involved in his corporate empire. To surrender any amount of control to anyone in this moment would be showing weakness in that corporate empire. And if there is anything that Matsushita Konosuke has taught him, is that a man who c cannot be weak. Matsushita Electric is an extension of who Matsushita Masaharu is as a man. He decided that it's high time he started acting like it. He will cut his own path into the future and leave the others behind his watch. Just a capital flight. Japanese entrepreneurs representing financial portfolios valued in millions and billions of yen are threatening to leave Guangdong, and that puts our economy in grave peril indeed. They say that as if we do not put our money where our mouth is as regards to prioritizing their concerns over coddling ranking file Zujin and Chinese workers, they'll leave for a place that is more friendly to their money. Fortunately, that is a problem that is not too difficult to solve. We can simply continue our pr with our prior decision to limit the rights of workers that will more than suffice to reassure them about our focus on their freedom to profit and innovate in the country. Right? God, Manchukuo is nearly... We're racing to meet Manchukuo at the bottom. But we finally have actual GDP growth. That's good. That is very good.
status quo prevails in Egypt. <sighs> Cooking rice is fairly easy and non-labor intensive, as it has been since time immemorial. However, the process of making rice cakes is more difficult, requiring two people, one to pound the rice into paste, one to turn into a thick mass, and taking several minutes. Metz Sheet Electric plans to change this with a new SD-182A, which makes uses integrated motors to allow one to both cook rice and make rice cakes at the same time. Just add the rice, turn it on, and after a few minutes and some rattling noises, you can enjoy Japan's favorite snack. Another household task, automated away. Product cycle is helping us once again. The overheated and overstuffed boredom of Tokyo, a smile was really no smile at all. Simply a tactic, a joyless device meant to peddle, swindle, or conceal. And at that moment, it was plastered across the Matsushita executive's face. At the moment, it didn't seem to be working. The corporate representatives looked at the man confused, mulling their options, checking their watches. The outer regions of the spirit were known to be a bad deal, and for those interested in wasting money on doomed sprees of industrialization, China appeared to be as much a lucrative money pit. No matter how many charts of executive use, Guangdong not appear to be the Spears' rising colony. It seemed to be a cheap copy of Home Island's best and a failing clone of China at worst. And so they yawned and doodled and waited to leave. When the presenter finally put away his baton and slides, he could see them packing, ready to head back to their offices and write off these few wasted hours. Instead, he called them to a different room. For lunch. The investors would get their meals, and they would be good meals. They would come with delicious sake, fish, whatever these investors desired. Yet the meal itself was only a secondary piece. The true play began when each investor pulled out their chairs and found a thick packet of cash, neatly arranged on the seat. And then, wordlessly, shamelessly, every investor changed their tune. Just never tacked from the Matsushita Corporation. Next, we have Trouble on the Border. Our borders with China have always been a source of trouble, but never to the extent of the present day in the chaos of China. The rival of our formerly docile national spirit and will to modernize and expel the foreign oppressors, spread star workers, masses of Chinese, even Zhujin workers, understandably angry about the focus on entrepreneurs and investors over, the, over them, begin to stream across the border in search of better deals that the, than they can find here. We will need to take a very close look at our policy on the maintenance of the frontier and decide what action, if any, we are going to take about these emigrants. Let's be careful lest our decision have a destabilizing effect on our economy. The European sales team had called ahead to Matsushita, warning him that the latest report will most likely require a dedicated term of transcribers on the Guangdong end. This alone told Matsushita all he needed to know, but he couldn't help but feel a little nervous waiting for secretaries to bring up the paper. His father-in-law, Matsushita Konosuke, had never been entirely on board with Matsushita's plans to expand the pact. Companies there had a disturbing tendency to be nationalized. However, as reams of paper were placed on his desk, Matsushita's nerves vanished. Sales were continuing to rise at an explosive rate, most notably among the German urban upper class. In the capital of Germany in particular, a city very concerned with projecting an image of modernity, these units were almost now ubiquitous. Outside the capital, the outlook was still very positive. While rural areas remained aloof, the small towns that housed so much of the German population were also taking Matsushita's units. Their products were rapidly swarming the efforts of Siemens and other European companies. As Matsushita fever was sweeping the Reich, and profits were streaming eastwards. The thought of a nice he he healthy bonus at the end of a year put a spring into Mat Matsushita's step for the rest of the day. A gamble repaid. Many times over. Although, it's not going to be as profitable next time, so... We will probably take a different... Uh, different step next time. Okay, we're starting to get more growth. We'll do a tax cut. We got positive growth for once.
Chief Executive. There's been a warning increase in cross-border smuggling gangs as of late, with an increase of 70% from last year. It must be remembered that for every one gang caught and arrested, two more have already succeeded in penetrating the heart of Guangdong. Most of these gangs are made up of Chinese nationalists or employed by nationalist organizations to smuggle weapons, pamphlets, and most importantly, people to agitate for reunification. In case these smuggling rings must be stopped for the sake of our stability and the survival of our state. This rings ever more true as a relationship for a Chinese population has been deteriorating significantly. Fire risk enough by not securing the borders at this crucial time. Subversion is seeping through the border more and more. We must take action as soon as possible. Make a decision as soon as possible for this amount of national security. Time security, be quick about it. No, that's enough. We still have good police control. It's good. We're gonna. Monrise and Momai. Okay. Here we go. Matsushita leads. This will the will of the August Corporation of Guangdong has entrusted Matsushita Masahara with the welfare of the land of three pearls. As Matsushita leads Guangdong in the company that bears his family name through the the world historical disaster that is the oil crisis, he remains on top of it all, with his hand on the tiller, fully in control of the direction that the state takes. As a result, Matsushita's leadership has begun to be seen as a fact of life. That man called Suzuki Taiichi was once chief executive a decade back is known only to historians, some Japanese, and Maleko itself. Virtually everyone else acts as if Matsushita, Matsushita Dono was always the chief executive. This attitude is indicative of the fact that Matsushita Masaharu has become an inseparable part of Guangdong's structure and way of governing. That's pretty good. Yeah, we can't research that. That makes sense. Light aircrafts. Go better. Go with better close air support, I guess. Why not? Matsushita Masaharu, chief architect of the state of Guangdong, self-proclaimed sole architect of its current prosperity, stood up the chamber of the legislative council council of the said state and made a speech that could be either herald could either herald the beginning of a new era of Matsushita dominance, stagnation and decline before its competitors, or worse of all possibilities, its total and enormous collapse for all eternity. I would may ask, why exactly was it that the speech could have such starkly different consequences? The answer is simple. In the speech, Executive Matsushita went above and beyond his rhetoric, choosing hardline warding of a sort that no one in the council had ever heard from him before. Speaking in obviously self-assured fashion, he announced his vision for the future. Time and again, he mentioned how Matsushita, its competent leadership, its innovative researchers, and diligent loyal workers would lead the glorious state of Guangdong into a new era of prosperity. But he also spoke of making sure that hostile competitors and subversive actors would be prevented one way or another, while with interfering with the divinely ordained Matsushita rule of Guangdong. Though Matsushita named no names, the room broke into a babble of word voices and made a speech. Chiong Kong delegates were repressing angle, anger, and Lee was visibly displeased. Sony delegates joined Fujitsu delegates in displeasure. First time in more than a decade, Morita Nabuka found agreement on something. The same expression, combining disgust with anger and fear, colored their faces. The Idachi delegates muttered among themselves, and Kamai's face was a terrible sight to behold. Amidst all this, Matsushita, his confidence unpunctured in a way it had never been before, continued with and finished his speech. As he went away, he noticed the delegate's displeasure and ignored it. Only confidence suffused him. Time would tell how justified his confidence was. Matsushita leads, Guangdong follows. As time has gone on from under the rule of Chief Executive Matsushita, the former the artificial state that supported and controlled this land of Guangdong has proven surprisingly resilient. It's manager of Stan and internitiant conflict between corporations, power struggles, riots, police disputes, gang warfare, and a myriad of other problems. These have managed to persist through both Yasuda and this present oil crisis, more or less unproud and unbroken. Having at last somewhat recovered from the most recent storm to battered shores, Guangdong looks to Matsushin Masaharu to lead it to the next stage of global history. Hmm. Khmer Republic? Okay. Settling to the usual spot on the police cafeteria, Officer Lamb takes in his surroundings as eats. A radio playing an irrelevant speech from Chief Executive. That explains why there was no music. Fly buzzing fearlessly around their food line. Had no one killed that thing yet? Finally, the one thing of interest in the room. A group of officers murmuring to each other. 
They all wore the same police uniform, had the same badge, and watched over the same populace, but the difference was stark. Most of the officers, fellow Zujin, cast wary glances at their Japanese peers from doing something as simple as standing in line to get food or walking to their seats. The Japanese, for their part, seemed to simply ignore the Zujin and stick to their own circles, except when they needed to smile together to give the image of solidarity to outsiders. Lamb struggled. There wasn't anything to do about it either. At the end of the day, it was Japanese money which paid his wages. At the thought, a surge of disgust at his own servility started to rise, but he forced it down. It was a fact of life, and he just had to live with it. He has to live, even if it is while facing disdain from above and anger from below. Ideas of freedom and independence had no place in Guangdong, nor in his life. He had to live, and the Japanese gave him the chance to do that. But what is the life of mere survival? Well, we have an island of stability? Question mark. For all our efforts in rallying the executives, stabilizing our finances, and maintaining production, integrity, controlling the flow of Chinese workers, and preventing Japanese entrepreneurs from fleeing en masse, one terrible constant remains, that of uncertainty. For all his power, intellect, and merits, Chief Executive Matsuharu is of exactly zero use in suppressing the unstoppable tide of conflict that now threatens the whole of Greater East Asia. All we can do is prepare what defense we can muster. All things together, keep innovating, and hope and pray to any heavenly power that will listen that Guangdong will be spared the worst of what the next few years are certain, near, nearly certain bring. I'll probably reinforce them there. It was all muscle memory by this point. Yoshiko took the lift down the ground floor, put her materials in her f work locker, then slid her punch card over the secretary at the front of the building. While doing this, she could be thinking of anything from work to dinner that night. It occurred to her as she walked out of that bit building. It had been a very long time since she would had a day she'd remembered. Her work was full of fluff. Fashion pieces, speculation on the endless games and musical chairs, played the top positions of large companies, tips for running a better household. She got these occasional social expose once or twice a year, but other than that, it was also pedestrian. Turnover was high of that paper, but Zujin Japanese women didn't get along too well with each other. All the f Japanese were there were graduates looking to ship off to Japan at the first opportunity. Yoshiko would have joined them too, but her own ship had well and truly sailed. She sighed, turned around, and stared at the building. Maybe this was her role to guide those young graduates through life in Guangdong, for they ever prepare them for their big break in Japan. It was her way of staying connected with her, the mother country, even though Guadong had been her home now for almost as long as she could remember. Heart torn in space. Not too long ago, the street had been the site of a temporary soup kitchen for the unemployed. Thousands packed together in shipping queues on this mundane little street in the middle of Koshu. But there was no way you could have known that just by looking at it. Why well, remember, though? And as she strolled through that quiet street, it set her to pondering. What really had changed? The old crisis was over, the Japanese were still in power, and the Chinese had bowed and scraped their noses against the floor. People looked away when the Japanese motorcades paraded down the streets, wary of being noticed by someone. Resignation. That was a suffocating blanket over the city, this country. They had the opportunity to rise up against the overlords. They failed. And now all there was to do there was to do was to go about one's daily business and try not to draw the eye of the pressers. But Wei believed that wasn't yet from yet over for them. Though their opportunity to dance away from them this time, there was definitely something in the air. A sense of sickness, of anger rising up beneath the calm exterior of submission. And Someday soon, she hoped, Guangdong would rise from its long slumber instead of Japanese screaming back across the ocean. Obedience and hatred, strolling in lockstep.
Yet another day passed and the legislature cancel. Today, same as yesterday, and what everyone expected to be perfectly emulated in the days to come. The actions screamed at each other to little avail. The chief executive would announce some new measure or another, which, if it was lucky, might form some insignificant benefit or another, if it did not immediately backfire or get shouted down by the rest of the council. Every day circling a little bit closer to the drain, but never quite reaching it. When Kamai once again took the stand of delegates, expected more of the same. Perhaps some new proposal for the state investment into organ harvesting or legally reclassifying the Chinese as livestock. By this point, Sony and Chiong Kong delegates had stopped even attempting to stifle groan. If Komai was in any way perturbed by this as he walked to the podium, he did not show it. <clears throat> Honored delegates. The ongoing crisis and the continued failures of state to combat the economic downturn have been a continued disappointment to both myself and my colleagues at Itachi. It is long past time to confront and act upon it, truths that my fellow delegates might find unpleasant. As such, I must announce that Adachi will be closing one-third of its Guangdong-based premises, and reloca relocating to more economically robust territories. This caused an uproar in the chamber. Over the shouting, one delegate's voice cut through, Are you insane? This country's already gone tits up. You want to kick us down even further? My first priority is the continuing prosperity of Adachi Limited, and your country, second. Our rivals, it seems, have welded wedded themselves far too strongly to this land without contingency. A tragedy for y'all, I'm certain, but Tachi's lucky to have friends further afield. Throw into the dogs. The news had not gone over well. The assembled workers of Tachi owned steel plants had spent time the first minute or so in shocked denial. Then came anger, and then Remaining stages of grief were not forthcoming. The sirens and loudspeakers from outside the barricade doors perhaps hopes it to signal the path towards bargaining, although so far only threats were made. Fang watched the hostages blubber, as she and six other workers stared down upon them, branching work tools and looted security batons as weapons. Looking at them, she felt a sense of disgust had poured it on nausea. She wondered if this was how they had felt looming over them, dominating them, giving out crumbs that let them continue the fragments of their miserable lives only to take it away than it suited them. Not pleasant, was it now? No more. The Japanese wouldn't take away their jobs or dignity this time. Not one more shred. Not one step back. One of Feng's least favorite managers, now a hostage, asked us in quivering, quivering lip in broken Cantonese, why, why are we doing this? This we did not do. No, no choice. Feng delivered a swift kick into the man's groin. Do what you want. Do you want your teeth to stay the... Sh stay... Do you want your teeth to stay the same shape? Then shut the fuck up! She yelled over his pain shrieks. No choice, my ass, shut, thought Fang. No choice but to cross over from Japan. No choice but to break our bodies on the altar of industry and their own careers. No choice but to do what they like with Chinese women with no possibility of any repercussions. You may not have signed the papers, but you chose all of this, thought Fang. Time to reap what you sow. Just when you thought it was going to get better. Frankly, come on, this is getting ridiculous. How many hours has it been now? If something happened to those hostages, it won't just affect your bottom line. Our most dedicated people are going to start packing their bags home, and then who will we be left with? Not to mention how Tokyo will react. It's imperative that you begin negotiations with Kamai, and fast. I must concur, said Marita, who was clearly doing his best to maintain an even tone even though his look of utter contempt. I have no idea what you expected from your little downsizing project beyond making ch the Chinese desperate. Ch human dignity means little to Tachi, but concessions must be made, and now, before the spreads. I'll be honest, said Abuka. I don't care for the welfare of this imbecilic brutes you call managers, nor for the common criminals in your employ, or formerly in your employ. But I'm forced to agree with the others here. You fucked up. Since you failed to deal with it yourself and promptly, we have no choice but to negotiate. Before this reaches Valeco, before this reaches Tokyo, before anyone gets any funny ideas. Understand? Komai had spent the last several minutes of the private meeting, and the silent scale that had threatened to grow, had been growing steady larger. As a crisis in his forehead had threatened to pierce his skull, he spoke. I wouldn't have expected such weakness from you of all people, Ibuka. Going soft in your old age? But enough of this. I was frankly insulted enough being dragged into this meeting. 
This disturbance is a Hitachi eternal affair and will be dealt with internally by Hitachi. I do not have the time or the inclination to look after your agenda nor your careers. Good evening, gentlemen. Remaining CEOs looked around the room for a moment. Well... Shit. <laughs>